<laughs> All right. Oh, no help. All right. So, the dusty streets are no place for an open wound. Dirt gets in the wound, gets infected, begins to smell. This man's had more than enough of his share of wounds, and, and they smell. Before people even see him, they smell him. In fact, people don't see him. They avoid him. They look away. They mutter things under their breath about the stench, about the, the unclean, about the outcast, the exile, who dares to set foot inside the village. This is no place for you, they say. And yet he's heard rumors of a healer come. And so he begins to, to reach out as he hears the crowd beginning to buzz. He knows. And he looks through the thin veil that covers his face from view. And he sees the man. And he begins to come up off his knees and crawl forward and reach out, not to touch, no one would let him touch him. But maybe just if he could get the man's attention, a word might heal him. And so he stretches out a hand, and he sees the face of the man turned toward him. He says, if you are willing, you could make me clean. And his eyes drop to the ground, knowing that that was probably the closest he would ever come. And suddenly, a hand touches him, not to push him away, not to move him, but as he looks up, here's the healer come down at his level, hand on his shoulder. A touch, that something that hasn't been felt in years since the leprosy took hold. He says, I am willing. Be clean. And as the man sees the compassion in the healer's eyes, he feels it begin to enter his soul and warm something that hasn't been felt in years. And as he begins to feel that within him, he looks down at his hands and he sees between the bandages no more white, dead skin. And he begins to pull the bandages off and he realizes that he has been healed. He sees healthy, new flesh and he is clean. And he leaps to his feet with joy and he begins to shout, I have been healed! I am clean. And he completely misses the commands of the healer who tries to get his attention, who says, stop. Don't tell anybody. This is not yours to tell. Go and show yourself to the priest. Do the sacrifice. Do the ritual cleansing. Let this be a testimony to them. And the man doesn't hear. This former leper who has been clean how can, he, how can he not tell people? He completely ignores the healer and with a shout of praise runs off to tell everybody that will listen how Jesus has healed him. It sounded like that. And Jesus knows in that moment that this is the end of his ability to walk among the villages of Galilee. He can no longer enter the towns. The Bible tells us after that, Jesus couldn't even get into the villages. There were so many people seeking him. Everybody that wanted a healing, everybody that wanted a flashy miracle came in search of this miracle maker. And he had to stay outside in the lonely places. You see, sometimes what we think is going to be an amazing message, even our testimony, but in the wrong context, does more to hurt the message of Jesus than to help it. This is part three of our series called The Shining, which if you saw the graphic, it was kind of creepy. I was like peeking out from behind the closet door like, hey, with a Bible, you know, like like my you know inner like creepy Bible-thumping evangelist came out for the photo. And um, 
Yeah. You will accept your shots. <laughs> and so we're doing this series called The Shining, which is comes from Matthew 5, where Jesus says, you're the light of the world. A, a city on a hill can't be hidden in the same way. Uh, uh, nobody lights a lamp and puts it on a stand and then puts a bowl on it. We're trying to help remove the bowl. You're the light of the world. You're meant to shine the light of Christ. How many of you know if it's, a, if it's dark and you shine a flashlight in a room, that's helpful? How many of you have ever had somebody walk up to you in a dark place and shine a flashlight directly in your face? Super helpful, right? No, same light has potential for usefulness. Used the wrong way, it's more harmful than helpful. Because now that you've had the flashlight shine in your eyes, even if somebody turns the lights on, you can hardly see anything. It takes a minute for that to fade out. So we've talked about appearance. We've talked about our attitude and how working those things out the right way can either hurt what we say or help. And now we're looking at our actions. And so I want to talk to you guys about some actions that help and some actions that hurt and, and how they affect the gospel. Because we want to be able to share our faith. And one of the best ways to share our faith is, like Christ said, just let your light shine. Be a reflection of him. Don't put stuff in the way that stops the reflection from showing through. So in 2009, I went to Spain on a mission trip. I went to a place called Segovia. We've got some photos here. Let's put up that first one. This is the cathedral in Segovia. It's really cool to go to a place like this because this cathedral was built 300 years before Columbus thought to ask for money to come over here. It was finished in the 1100s. Renovated 200 years ago, I think. That's a massive freaking church. If you could see it from the sky, I don't have a photo of that because I did not fly over the city. Um, the building is shaped like a giant cross. The part that's coming out this way and that, this is the top, this is the side. There's a long part that goes that way that's twice the length of these parts and then there's an, a copy of that on the back side. So it looks like a giant cross. It's huge. It's empty. It's a museum now. They don't do Jesus over there. Next slide. This is the castle of the city. I can't remember what it's called, but that's the castle. We got to go in there. It's pretty neat. Next. This is the aqueduct. It's very famous. It was built by the Romans um, around the time of Jesus without mortar, without pins or sticks or anything else to hold it together. It's a bunch of rocks stacked on top of each other. It runs for a couple of miles. And it used to bring water from one end of the city all the way overhead and then down through tunnels into the castle. So they had fresh water that came from the other side of the city. And that thing, you can see the people at the bottom. The next photo shows you a little more scale. We're walking under one of those arches. Those rocks are huge. And a couple of them, you can see holes, big holes in them, little dots. They had these crazy cranes that used like reverse pressure, like the more weight it held, the tighter it pulled, and they lifted these up with this primitive pulley system all the way 2,000 years ago. It's crazy. Things still standing, still doesn't have mortar. You can stand under it and look up, and you can see the sky between the rocks. It's an impressive city. It's amazing. It's ancient. They had Jesus before Europe was Europe. They've kind of lost him now. So we went over there. So let's look at some of the stuff we did. So we didn't go there just to sightsee. We did a lot of this. This was our morning prayer meeting. We sat in one of the hotel rooms, and there's a few more people off camera, including me. So I was taking the photo. And uh, we would have a three-hour-long prayer meeting in the mornings. We would eat breakfast, and then we would just pray. And we would pray for God to give us uh, motivation and inspiration for what we were doing. We would pray for the church that we were helping to build. We went there on an evangelism trip to help promote the church that we had helped build the year before. And so next one. So we did some of this. We went into the town, and uh, they had a, a nursing home. And we went and visited the nursing home where the Catholic nuns that worked here didn't even pray with the people that were there. The families of these people didn't bother to visit. I think the next slide is also the nursing home. This guy here, nobody bothered with him much because he wasn't responsive for over a year until this guy. I have trouble pronouncing his name, otherwise I'd tell it to you. Um, but he came over, and he began to talk to him, and they said, don't bother. He doesn't speak. 
And he said, well, that's okay. What's his name? Vicente. Okay, well, Vicente. In el nombre de Jesús. Mirame. Look at me. And he kept saying that, and then he said, he said, Vicente, Vicente. In el nombre de Jesús. Dígame. Talk to me. And they said, sir, seriously, you're wasting your time. Stop this. And we all gathered around, and we began to pray for Vicente. And he continued to talk to him, and he would pray, and then he would talk to him, and he would pray. And about 10 minutes into it, Vicente looked up and opened his eyes. This hadn't happened in over a year. He looked directly at uh, my friend there, and then he spoke. And they had a short conversation, and then Vicente asked for some water. We went and showed compassion and love and interest in people that they hadn't received in years. Next slide. We did a lot of this. This was uh, that's me in the black shirt going. <laughs> this is our stomp routine. See what you do is that was the um, the plaza, the small plaza that we would go and do our routine at. And uh, you can see there's two streets that go that way, and these are streets that don't allow cars except for the cops. And so it's all these. This is the main thoroughway where all the people just walk through the heart of the city. And so there's two streets that way, and there's two going the other way. And so this is at the convergence of a bunch of places. There's a lot of little cafes and shops right in this area. It's a great space to be. And so we would go there every single afternoon and do this routine and gather a crowd. There's another shot of the stomp routine next. So that's our team. That's my little brother there in the T-shirt um, with the beard and the hair. Um, so uh, that's my little baby brother. He's like this tall. Um, and uh, so we would go there, and you, what you do is you gather a crowd by doing something stupid, and everyone goes, dumb Americans, wonder what's happening. And then when you have a crowd, you get to talk to them about Jesus. We would have a short testimony, and I got to share my testimony in Spanish, yelling out to a crowd of people in Spain. And I got to share my testimony and tell them the gospel. And then we said, if you have any questions, talk to somebody with a flyer. And we would hand out flyers for the church so they could come check it out that way. And we would just talk to people and pray with them. And we got to do amazing things like lay hands and pray with a woman who was drunk, like falling over drunk. She was having trouble standing against a pillar. And we got to pray with her and lay hands on her and just tell her about Jesus. And as she began to willingly ask for prayer, we prayed for her, and she stood up sober. I don't know if you've ever been drunk before, but it didn't go that quick. She was stone cold sober. Couldn't even smell it on her anymore. And it was kind of like the leper I was talking about. You could smell her from a couple feet away. It smelled like you walked into a bottle of gin. It was gross. Next photo. This was in Madrid, so we went from Segovia to Madrid our last night in Spain. And this is a ministry called On the Red Box. Guess why? To stand on a red box. So this lady uh, does these awesome, funny songs where she just, like, on the fly writes crazy songs about weird people that end up coming to Jesus. And then she shares her testimony, and then people get saved. And so this is a street evangelism ministry. They have a school for evangelism that runs out of Madrid. And they do this. That We went and prayed with them. They had a four-hour prayer meeting. And then we went and did this for two hour, three hours in the street. Um, I got to stand on the red box and share my testimony. Uh, and we got to talk to people and stuff after that. And they do this at seven days a week, 365 days a year. They, they go out and they do this. Uh, next photo, here's the crowd that was gathered while I was speaking. I'm off camera uh, on the red box. But so here's some people, and it goes back four or five rows of people. We probably had about 30 or 40 people gathered. Um, and I got to share my testimony and uh, a little bit of uh, evangelism, the gospel message in Spain. This was stuff that's helpful. And we one of the things that they do, they don't ever go out without a list of the local churches. And they know people at all of these churches. They can connect people to the right church, that these little churches that are springing up around Madrid. The same thing in, in um, Segovia. We had the flyer for the evangelical church that we were helping promote. And so when we would talk to people, we wouldn't just say, like, oh, sweet, you accepted Jesus? Awesome. I will never see you again because I live in another continent. We would tell them, and then we would say, here's the church. Go, go talk to these people. If a couple of them are here with us, you can... You can visit this church, and they would love to have you and help you grow in this decision you've made to know Christ. And it, it was awesome. Now, some of you may know that there are definitely ways to hurt the gospel in the way we share, right? I mean, some stuff we do uh, 
sharing at the wrong time like the leper. Yeah? He went out and shared at the wrong time, and it made it so that Jesus, everyone's focused on the wrong thing. Later, when people come asking, and, and Jesus starts to try to tell them why he's there, and they say, no, 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 show us another miracle. He goes, no, I'm done with that. I'm done with the miracles. All you want is spectacle. Oh, just show us another sign. Here's the sign I'll give you, the sign of Jonah. He says, bury me three days, I'll get up. That's it. End of show. Thank you. And he walks away. He, he wasn't in it for the spectacle. The spectacle validated his ministry, his message. And so the leper didn't get that. All he wanted to do was tell about the spectacle. And yeah, he probably got that this is the Messiah. This guy actually has power. He healed me. But because of that, everyone's all flat. I want to see you heal a leper. And he couldn't go into the towns anymore. He couldn't do the ministry he came there to do. How about hypocrisy? Anybody ever tell somebody about Jesus and then that person you just finished telling about how awesome Jesus is, how much your life has changed, and they catch, catch you like, you know, you turn around, you're doing some stuff, you stub your toe, and you're like, ah, mother! Oh, sorry. I meant mother of Jesus that hurt, like, you know what I mean? Or, I mean, I've shared before, like, I had some guys I was talking to and then I ended up going out drinking with them because I worked with them and I was of age. I didn't break the law, but I told them about how God had helped me stop drinking. And I went and got drunk with them. They all called me a hypocrite for the rest of the time I worked there. I wouldn't hear anything about church. The way, and we've talked about our attitude, the way we treat lost people, the way we view them, the way we treat each other even, hurts the gospel. There are songs written about it by Christians and non-Christians about how horrible the church is to each other. It's ridiculous. It's easy for our actions to override anything we ever say. How many people have ever, I've got an uncle that doesn't believe, and whenever I talk about Jesus, he brings up stuff like Westboro Baptist Church. I'm like, yeah, I know, those guys are morons. But they're what people see as Jesus, and all people see is not anything that we say in love. That has to overcome the actions of a bunch of rednecks going, God hates everybody. Our actions can do far more to hurt or help the gospel than anything we'll ever say. I want to show you guys a, a little quick clip here. kind of shows what I'm talking about. Let's just take a minute. Hola! Hola, amigo! Hola, mi amigo! Hola, amigo! Hola, mi amigo! Por favor, uno momento. Ah. Hola, vecino. Uh, te gustera venir uh, conmigo a la iglesia el domingo. Mi iglesia es muy dorito. Dur dorito? Uh, oh, oh <laughs> dervitido. Uh, y se puede transformar tu vida de pecano. Oh, pecado, pecado. <laughs> not, not pecano, but, but uh, pecano es muy delicioso. Sí, 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 sí. Sí, I, sí. I don't even know. Sí. I don't even know what you're saying. You speak English. Yes. You're not a Spaniard. Well, I'm a quarter Hispanic, but I don't I don't speak the language. Seriously. Yeah, I never Seriously. I never learned the language. Seriously. What were you saying? Never mind. Awesome ways to not share your faith. That guy's never coming to church, right? Don't do it like that. This is this is how we're supposed. We're not we're not meant to be known for being ignorant, or being hateful, or being stupid. Um, Jesus actually gave us a different vision. If you've got a Bible in your lap, or if you've got one on your phone, and you're really quick with it, you can turn to John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. If you don't want to do that, or if you know that you won't make it in time, we got it up on the screen. You can do that. But it says. Maybe. 
A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The uniform of Jesus is loving each other. The church, the church being a place of such awesome, amazing brotherly love, fatherly love, romantic love in the right scenarios, marriage, and being a place known for its love in a way that says, we are not from this world. We're not just happy people. We've got something that comes from far beyond this place, that comes from a far deeper place. That's what we're to be known for. How many people in your life that don't come to church with you know you're a Christian? How many of those people know you're a Christian because you are the most loving person they've ever met? I know that's not me. Not all the time. I wish I could say, like, be like me. Come on. I'm awesome at this. I'm terrible at it. It's hard to love people. They kind of suck. Even some of you guys, it's hard to love you sometimes. You kind of suck. I love you. I do. I do. And honestly, some of you that have had the most like difficult conversations with, I love you more. Because we've gone through some stuff. And I've been willing to walk through you, that with you and not just go, yeah, I'm done with you. You suck at this. Go away. You know what I mean? Like, we've gone through some crud, and, and that, and as I've sat and prayed with you and talked with you about it, that that, and, and many of you, same thing, that as we go through some stuff, that's where we were able to show our love. When we have grace with each other, when it's like, dude! Ugh. I read, I, I watched a video, I didn't read this, I, re I watched a video about a, a youth pastor, some of the most amazing grace I've ever seen. Short version of the story, there was an EMT driving at the end of a long, long shift. He falls asleep at the wheel, he cruises into the oncoming lane and hits an SUV. That SUV was carrying the wife of a youth pastor who was pregnant with their unborn son, and their toddler was in the back seat on the other side of the car. The toddler got away with a couple of bruises from the car, stra from the car seat straps. The baby died immediately because the steering wheel went through the wife's stomach. Then she died in surgery later that night. After two years of trial and investigation and everything else where they had a no contact order, the youth pastor asked for the lightest sentence possible. The guy got out with time served and probation. And they both were Christians. They both were praying about how they could possibly connect and the one guy wanted to apologize and the other guy wanted to let him know I don't blame you for this I, I know that Jesus still loves you and I want to share that with you if it's at all possible and they ended up running into each other at a store and they recognized each other from the trial and everything and they as they looked at each other they both burst into tears and just threw a big hug and now the youth pastor is that guy's mentor and they meet once a week and he's discipling this young man in Christ. That's grace. That's the kind of love that the church should be known for. Something that doesn't even make sense in this world. How many people would line up to help that guy take revenge? That's the kind of nonsense you see on the internet when you read a story like this. That's the kind of thing you see on Facebook when people talk about like, oh man, I had the rudest person. You know what? We should go slash their tires. Like just crazy, stupid, stupid things. Let's get back at them. How about let's love them? Let's show people love that doesn't even make sense. It's inhuman, not because it's horrible, but because people aren't capable of this. And when they go, what is wrong with you? People aren't capable of this kind of love. And you can say, yeah, the spirit of the living God lives within my heart. He's capable of this. I want to be known for his love, not for what I'm capable of. Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23. Does anybody have this memorized? Does anyone know what it is? Oh, it's there. Take it away. Does anyone have it memorized? Yeah? Wait, 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 wait. In the mic. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Boom! Yeah! 
And this is the new version of the NIV. I don't know why they decided forbearance was a better word than patience. When I looked up what forbearance meant, it said patience. So, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So here's how you share your faith. Here's how your actions share your faith. You bless people. We've been talking about this in our church for a, a year now. We printed these cards a year ago. And we mentioned it in here several times. B-L-E-S-S. -S. You guys can remember that, right? I want to bless people. Begin with prayer. Talk to God about them. Ask God for opportunities to hang out with them, to bless them. Listen to them. Hear their story out. That's one of the things we did a lot of in Spain was listen to where people were. We made no assumptions. We found out that one guy we were talking to was a Muslim, and so we heard him out. And as we continued talking with him, we listened to what his hang-ups were with Christianity or where he was at spiritually. We didn't come in with our list of, like, these are my apologetic arguments against Muslims. We listened to where he was at, and we're able to just say, look, here's the difference between our God and your God, the way you understand him. Our God is a God of love. Yours is a God of do enough good things, and maybe I'll let you into my spot. Eat with them. It's amazing what you get to do over food, and that's kind of cool, right? I mean, so far this is pretty easy. All you got to do is pray for people, listen to them a little bit, hear them share what their life's about, what they've gone through. Eat with them, hang out with them. But that's where you begin to form tight bonds. Who do you eat with the most? Family. Friends. Eat with them. Spend time having food and just talking and joking and getting to know them. Serve them. Find ways to serve them, even if that's... It could be as simple as this. Somebody at school, you're praying about it. You go, God, show me one, one classmate who I could do this for. And then you just start hanging out with them at lunch and listening to their stories and listening to what they're about and just hearing them, not waiting for a chance to respond, just listening, hearing what their life is about. What, have they ever been to church? What's that like? What's your family like? Does your family go to church? Do they believe in anything? Do they do anything? Like, what do you guys do for Christmas this year? Whatever. You eat with them, and then you serve them. You just pick up their tray, and you take it to the trash. Or you take them out to eat and you buy their food. Or you guys are out at Del Taco and you just clean up the table. Whatever. Simple things that just show them like, hey, why are you always nice to me like this? Serving. And then at the end of all of that, you get to share your story. Then you get to say, this is what I was like. And then I met Jesus. He changed me and this is how I am now. I'm not perfect, but this is what I do. We are meant to be known for our love. That is the call that Jesus gave to us, that you are to be known as my disciples, not because you shout at people, not because you hit them with my books, but because you love each other in a way that nobody else can identify with, and they want to know how that happens. And then when they're part of how you show that, how you live this out, is by blessing them. So your small group leaders have some questions for you, have some things to talk about with this bless concept, and they're going to work that through with you. I'm going to ask you guys to even now begin thinking, asking God as you even walk back there, God, who's one person? Who's one person I can start to do that with? Yeah? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your, an opportunity to share your word and to share some of the awesomeness that I got to experience in your name uh, across the pond in Spain. And uh, I pray that you would help each of these students to be able to not only know you on a deep level, but serve you in a way that blesses people here, blesses people up in Carson City or over in California, all the way across the world, that they would live out your call to be known for their love for other people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, small groups. If you don't have a small group leader, come see Scott. <laughs>